On the early morning of April 28, 1908, a farmhouse in La Porte, Indiana suddenly caught fire and everything inside the house was burnt to ash. Searchers began looking through the burnt house to try and find the family that lived there, but to their horror, they found the dead bodies of three children and one adult, and the adult's head was missing. Little did they know, the farm they were on was the grave site for the victims of one of the most notorious female serial killers ever, and when her 20 year secret was finally exposed, it shocked the entire world. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, I hope you're all having a great day. For today's story, we're going to be talking about the female serial killer, Belle Gunness. You may have heard of this story before, it's pretty well known, but I chose to cover it anyways because it's a very interesting case and it's very disturbing, which are the kind of cases I like covering on this channel. With that being said, grab yourself some coffee, sit back and relax, and let's get straight into the story. Belle Gunness was born on November 11th, 1859 in Selbu, Norway, and she was the youngest of eight children. Her birth name was actually Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseth, but she changed her name to Belle Peterson after she moved to the US in 1881, and she changed her name to Belle Gunness after she married her second husband, Peter Gunness, in 1902. Belle came from a very poor family. She lived in a small, cramped cottage with her parents and seven siblings, and her father was a farmer and stonemason. The rest of Belle's family, including her mother, would help her father raise animals on his farm whenever they could, and when Belle was around 14, she worked on other people's farms by herding their cattle and milking their cows. Belle also went to the forest by herself and picked up twigs on the ground for the fire in her cottage because her father couldn't afford firewood, so her family was by all means very hardworking, but they made just enough money to eat, and by eat, I mean just above starving. Belle's family was hoping she'd marry a wealthy man so her husband could support their family, but Belle was considered unattractive and she was also from a lower social class, so wealthy men weren't really interested in her. They generally choose women from better off families, so that meant Belle had to make a living herself. Because Belle was born into poverty, she always dreamed about having money and as she got older, she did not let go of that obsession with money and that's the reason she became the serial killer that we know today. In 1881, when Belle was 21 years old, she moved to Chicago, Illinois because one of her sisters and her family lived there and Belle made a living working odd jobs, which were mostly sewing and cleaning. By 1884, Belle met and married a Norwegian man named Mad Sorensen, and together they had four biological children and one foster child. Mads worked as a night watchman for a retail store, and later for a railway company, and that was Belle's ticket to escaping poverty. Mads made middle class money, and while that isn't the lavish lifestyle that Belle was looking for, it was better than being dirt poor, and Mads allegedly spoiled Belle by buying her whatever she wanted, whether that was clothes or jewels or something else, so Belle was happy to settle down with him. In 1894, Mads and Belle bought a sweet shop after saving money for several years, but the sweet shop turned out to be a bad investment because it wasn't in a great location and their offerings were pretty bad so they couldn't attract many customers and for Belle that must have been very disheartening because she was trying to grow her wealth and become her own boss but her savings or mad savings were burning away and she did not want to be poor again so she came up with a very deceptive plan and this is where her life of crime begins. Less than a year after Belle opened the sweet shop, a fire suddenly broke out and everything inside the shop was burned to ash. Belle claimed that the cause of the fire was an exploding kerosene lamp, but when the fire was investigated, no kerosene lamp was ever found and Belle had the sweet shop insured, so she received a nice payout from her insurance company. I can't tell you exactly how much that was, but it was enough for Mads and Belle to purchase a house, 
but that house also burned down and Belle received another payout from her insurance company. After Belle experienced what it was like being rich, she wanted more money and she would do whatever it took to obtain that money, even if it literally meant burning houses down or even killing someone for it. Around one or two years after the sweet shop burned down, Mads and Belle had their first biological child together, a baby girl named Caroline, and shortly afterwards they had another biological child, this time a baby boy named Axel, and then two more biological daughters named Myrtle and Lucy. The reason I've been using the term biological is because before the sweet shop burned down, Mads and Belle adopted a baby girl named Jenny Olsen, because they had trouble conceiving, but they somehow conceived four children after the sweet shop burned down when Belle was nearly 40 years old, so there is a lot of speculation on whether those four children belonged to Belle biologically or if they were adopted. But those four children used their supposed father's surname, Sorensen, while Jenny kept her biological father's surname, Olsen, so that's why I'm referring to them as her biological children. When Caroline was less than a year old, she allegedly died from a bowel disease called acute colitis in 1896, and Axel allegedly died from the same disease in 1898 when he was also less than a year old. I can't tell you their exact ages because their date of births aren't documented, but they were both babies when they died, and Belle is believed to be responsible for their deaths. Before the children died, they showed symptoms similar to that of someone who was poor poisoned, and Belle had taken out life insurance policies on both of them shortly before their deaths, so they were probably her first victims, albeit not confirmed. And back in those days, infant mortality was very high, so no one suspected anything, and Belle allegedly got away with murdering her children. By mid-1900, Mads had taken out two life insurance policies on himself that were worth around $5,000 in total, and for Belle, that was life-changing money, but the only way she would receive the full $5,000 was if Mads died on the date of July 30th, 1900, because that's when the two policies overlapped each other. That date is when the first policy ended and the second one started, so if Mads died on that specific date, Belle would receive two payouts instead of one, and you can probably see where this is going. On July 30th, Mads went to work feeling perfectly fine, but when he returned home, he started feeling really sick, so he spent the rest of the day in bed with Belle nursing him back to health, and by nursing, I mean Belle gave Mads some quinine to make him feel better, which is a type of medicine commonly used back in those days to treat malaria and fevers, but when Mads took the medicine, his condition only got worse, and he slowly passed away in bed while Belle did her house duties and ignored him the entire time. I can't say for certain how Mads died, because the information out there is a bit wishy-washy. Some sources say it was from a cerebral hemorrhage, other sources say it was from heart failure, but he was probably poisoned like Caroline and Axel, and when Belle was questioned about Mads' death, she just said she gave him some quinine to make him feel better, and when she went to check on him, he died. There wasn't enough evidence to suggest foul play, so Belle received the $5,000 from the insurance company, and she used that money to buy a pig farm in La Porte, Indiana, and move in there with her three remaining children, Jenny, Myrtle, and Lucy. The last time Belle did any farming was when she lived with her parents, but now she had her own farm and her own animals, and she probably didn't want to be totally dependent on that insurance money because it would eventually run out, so she made a living from slaughtering her animals and selling their meat to her local community. By early 1902, Belle met and married a Norwegian man named Peter Gunnis, but within less than a week of being married, Peter's baby daughter from his previous marriage suddenly passed away. In the first week of their marriage, Peter left the house and told Belle to look after his baby daughter, also named Jenny, but when he returned, Jenny became very sick and died. Seven-month-old Jenny allegedly died from a condition called pulmonary edema, which is when too much fluid builds up in your lungs, but that's probably not how she died because before her death she was very healthy, but when Belle came along, 
something happened. I can't say for certain how Jenny died, but a lot of people believe that Belle drowned her to death so she could collect her life insurance money, but it's not known if Belle actually had a life insurance policy on Jenny or not. Peter was obviously very distraught about Jenny's death, but he didn't know that Belle supposedly killed her, so they remained together and continued their marriage like normal, but eight months later, in December 1902, tragedy struck again. Around a couple of weeks before New Year, Jenny Olsen, who was around 12 years old, ran to her neighbor's house at around 3am and started banging on their door. The family that lived in that house were obviously very startled to be woken up so early, but when one of them went to check what was going on, they found Jenny at the door holding an iron poker and screaming and crying that her father burned himself and she needed their help immediately. Two of the neighbors rushed to the farm with Jenny, but by the time they got there, it was already too late because Peter was dead and his lifeless body was on the ground in the living room. According to Belle herself, what happened was, Peter was grabbing his shoes from the kitchen next to the stove, but when he was bending over to grab his shoes, a meat grinder and a bowl containing hot salty water fell from the shelf above and hit him smack on the head. The hot water left Peter with severe burns on his neck and back, and the meat grinder left him with a huge laceration on the back of his head. Bell said she tried helping Peter, but he said he was okay and didn't need any help, and he went to rest on the sofa. But when the neighbors arrived at the house, they found Peter's dead body face down on the ground in the living room, and Bell couldn't explain how that part happened. To no one's surprise, this story didn't add up, and no one believed what Bell was saying, and for the first time ever, she was truly suspected of murdering someone. The other deaths she was involved in, there wasn't enough reason to suspect homicide because the deaths were seemingly more natural, but this time, there isn't anything natural about a meat grinder falling on someone's head and their dead body lying face down on the ground and Belle waiting several hours before she sought help. When Peter's autopsy was carried out, the doctors couldn't find any burns on his body, like Belle claimed, and there were severe lacerations on his face, as if he'd been beaten with a blunt weapon. But for some reason that I cannot explain, Peter's death was ruled an accident, and Belle was never charged with murder and she received $3,000 from his life insurance policy. Before Peter died, he allegedly made Belle pregnant, and she gave birth to their son, Philip, in May 1903. Belle would have been in her 40s when that happened, and although it's not impossible to get pregnant at that age, it is very unlikely, especially in those days when fertility treatments like IVF didn't exist, and you had to conceive naturally. So there is a lot of speculation on whether Philip was Belle's biological child, or was he another foster child like Jenny Olsen? Speaking of Jenny Olsen, she probably knew how Peter actually died because she was 12 years old at the time, but Belle probably told her not to tell anyone or say anything, or maybe she just thought that Jenny believed her meat grinder story and didn't say anything beyond that. We don't really know what was going through Jenny's mind at the time. As for Myrtle and Lucy, they were five and three years old respectively when that incident occurred, so it's not really clear if they understood what happened or not. Despite all the horrific things that Belle had done, she was apparently a very loving mother to her children, and they lived seemingly normal lives. It's just that Belle had a dark side to her, and her children, except Jenny Olsen, were probably unaware of that dark side. Belle never remarried after Peter died because she was never really looking for that companionship and she was fine with being single, but she did need help with running her farm because she was doing that by herself and that was a lot of work. So she placed job ads in newspapers looking for someone to work for her and sure enough, she found someone. A Norwegian man named Olaf Lindbo signed up for the job, and when he started working for Bell, everything was going as expected. Olaf worked on the farm, 
Bell paid him for his work, but then they started dating each other and Olaf mysteriously disappeared. I wish I could tell you more about what happened, but that's literally all we know. Olaf started working for Bell for a short period and then he mysteriously disappeared and we don't know where he went or what happened to him, but a lot of people believe that Bell killed him and buried his body on her farm. After Olaf disappeared, Bell hired another worker named Henry Gerhold, whom she also dated, but just like Olaf, Henry mysteriously disappeared and we don't know where he went or what happened to him, but Bell probably had something to do with that as well. Several more unidentified men worked on the farm after Henry disappeared, who also mysteriously disappeared, but Henry and Olaf were the first two workers on the farm, and the total number of people that disappeared on that farm is anyone's best guess. In mid-1907, Bell hired and dated a man named Ray Lamphere, but unlike Henry and Olaf, Ray didn't mysteriously disappear. Ray lived with Bell, and that was completely life-changing for him because he was a very unstable person. Ray drank heavily and gambled a lot, so any money he earned was quickly gone. But when Bell was brought into his life, he now had a stable household, his meals were cooked, and of course, he had a good sex life. But what Ray didn't know was that Bell had a secret lover for almost a full year before she met him, and when Ray found out about that, that changed everything. Since 1906, Bell had been writing love letters to a man named Andrew Helgelian, who was very eager to work on her farm, and in early 1908, Andrew was given the green light. Bell kicked Ray out of her house and moved him to the barn so Andrew could move inside with her, and as you could imagine, that didn't sit very well with Ray. Ray was basically living his best life up to that point. His bills were paid, his meals were cooked, he had great sex, and then this man he had never met before was suddenly brought into his life and everything was taken away from him. Ray couldn't do anything about it because Bell was his employer, so their relationship abruptly ended, but Ray continued working for Bell, and the only time they'd ever speak to each other was when Bell needed some work done. Ray was actually extremely lucky, and Andrew was the exact opposite, because the only reason Bell hired and dated him was because he was rich. Not long after Andrew moved in with Bell, they went to a bank together because Bell was hoping they could withdraw around $3,000 from Andrew's life savings, but that wasn't possible because they had to wait a few business days for the transaction to go through. We don't know the details on this, but Bell probably somehow convinced Andrew to send him his money, and that was the last time anyone saw Andrew again, because after that, he mysteriously disappeared like Henry and Olaf, and we don't know if Bell collected the $3,000 or not. Unlike Henry and Olaf, Andrew had a family that was expecting him to return home the week after he started working for Bell, but when he didn't return home, his brother Osley got very worried and started writing letters to Bell asking where Andrew was. Bell responded to Osley's letters by writing to him that Andrew told her he was going to visit their other brother in Chicago and that Bell shouldn't write back to him until he sent her a letter first after he arrived in Chicago. But Bell never heard anything back from Andrew and she continued working on her farm without him as if nothing happened. Osley knew Bell was lying to him because he read all the love letters that she wrote to Andrew and it didn't make any sense as to why she'd give up so easily on someone she was so attached to and the way she wrote the letter made it seem like she didn't care that Andrew was missing. So Osley packed his bags and went to Laporte, Indiana to see what was going on. In the meantime, Bell didn't pay Ray the full amount for the work he did on our farm and so there were work relationships started falling apart. In February 1908, Bell fired Ray for good, and a few days later, she hired a man named Joe Maxson to take his job. Ray hired a lawyer to sue Bell, but Bell contacted the authorities and told them that Ray was stalking her and she wanted him to stay away from her farm. So there was a lot of tension between Bell and Ray. They were always arguing and threatening each other, and that tension got so bad that around a month after Ray was fired, he allegedly set Bell's farm on fire to get revenge 
and that is how all her serial killing secrets were exposed. On the early morning hours of April 28, 1908, the day the fire broke out, Joe woke up to a thick fog of smoke and immediately rushed out of the wing of the house that he lived in to let Belle know there was a fire, but her doors were locked and she was seemingly stuck inside with her children. Joe was screaming to his neighbours for help and when the neighbours heard him, they rushed to the farm with a wood axe to break down Belle's front door. When they broke down the door, it was far too late because the flames had already consumed the ground floor. Joe and his neighbours assumed that Belle was stuck inside the house with her children, spoiler alert, she wasn't, so they grabbed a ladder from the farm to try and save anyone inside from the second floor, but they couldn't because the fire quickly spread to the roof and the entire house was quickly engulfed in flames. Back in those days, fire brigades weren't really a thing, or maybe they were, but they weren't as equipped as the fire brigades we know today, and they could take hours to arrive at the scene, or in this case, there wasn't any fire brigade, so the fire eventually burned out by itself. Neighbours and other people that witnessed the fire came to the house to search for Belle and the children, but all they found was the burned remains of their belongings, and no one knew where the family was. That was until one of the volunteers was digging through the burned remains of the house and they found four human bodies. One of the bodies belonged to an adult woman and the other three were children's bodies and everyone initially assumed they were Belle and her children's bodies but it was a lot more complicated than that. While the three children's bodies were three of Belle's four children, Myrtle, Lucy and Philip, but we don't know who the adult's body was because it was never identified. A lot of people thought and still believe that it's Belle's body because the four bodies were found in the basement all huddled up as if Belle's children were clinging to her in their last moments, but the woman's body was decapitated and her head was never found, so if it was Belle's body, then why was her head missing? After the four bodies were discovered, Belle mysteriously disappeared like her victims, and we don't know where she went or what happened to her. Whether that was or wasn't Belle's body is something we'll never know, but what we do know is there were a lot more than just four bodies found on our farm. Less than a week after the fire broke out, while searchers were still looking through the burned remains, Osley arrived at the farm to join the search because Andrew was still missing, but when he was digging through the burned remains, he found a sack that smelled absolutely horrendous. So Osley opened the sack and unfortunately for him, he found Andrew's decapitated head. There were several other sacks beside the sack that Osley found that contained human remains from several other victims and when the searchers looked through the pigsty, they found the dismembered remains of Jenny Olsen, who mysteriously disappeared in late 1906. We don't know the exact number of people that Bell killed, but she likely killed somewhere between 14 to 40 people, with most of them being adult men, and most of her victims were found buried on her farm, as opposed to three of her children who were found dead in the basement. We don't know exactly how Bell killed each of her victims, but there is a theory that she poisoned their dinner coffee to incapacitate them and then she'd beat their heads with some sort of blunt weapon like she did to Peter and then she'd butcher their bodies and feed them to her pigs. The prime suspect for starting the fire was Ray because of his hostile relationship with Belle but when the authorities tracked him down at a different farm that she was recently hired at and questioned him about the fire he denied everything. Ray was arrested nonetheless and later shown the bodies of the three children but he was as shocked and disgusted as everyone else and he still denied everything. Despite the lack of evidence, Ray was taken to trial a month after the fire occurred and he was given a 2 to 21 year sentence for arson but he was never charged with murder. The jury agreed that Ray never had any murderous intent when he allegedly set the fire but he was rather heartbroken or jealous and 
simply acted out on revenge. Ray never served his full sentence because he died in prison from tuberculosis less than two years after he was sentenced. There are a lot of theories regarding what happened to Belle or why her farm was set on fire, and although we have no way of verifying any of this, here are some of those theories. The first theory was that after Osley wrote to Belle that he was coming to the farm to see Andrew, Belle set her house on fire, staged her death, and fled to some unknown location to start a new life because she was afraid she'd get caught for her crimes. The second theory was that Ray or an accomplice murdered Belle so Ray could get revenge, and either Ray or the accomplice substituted Belle's body with another woman's body to throw off any suspicion on them. The third theory was that Belle committed suicide, either due to guilt over her crimes or to evade capture, and she set her house on fire to confuse investigators about her face. But that theory doesn't explain how her body was decapitated. Whatever happened to Belle on the day of the fire, we'll never know, but that's the story of one of the most notorious female serial killers ever, and may she rest in hell, and her victims rest in peace. That's all for today's video, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you have any video suggestions, then please leave them down below in the comment section. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos, and I will see you again next time.